So with drugs, materiality, right? Materiality, quantitative and qualitative materiality. So you should know what, the, what we mean by materiality. Um, and that it is highly, it's a highly judgment based on the auditor's judgment. Um, the quantitative materiality is based on a benchmark that the auditor decides what benchmark, whether that's going to be total assets, operating income, net income, the auditor decides what the appropriate benchmark is going to be and what the appropriate percentage is, somewhere between three to five percent that they'll assign. So that's the quantitative materiality and that is the what we call planning materiality. So the auditor determines, uses a benchmark, whatever percentage they assign, and let's say they come back and the, that number is 700,000. Well, that, that's the planning materiality. So if the financial statements are misstated uh, collectively 700,000 or better, then it would, if the, audit, if the client doesn't adjust it, the financial statements will be considered to be materially misstated overall. Of that 700,000, which is the planning materiality, you're going, the auditor allocates to the balance sheet um, uh, that materiality to different uh, accounts in the, the balance sheet. So they might allocate 200,000 to accounts receivable, 300,000 to inventory, 100,000 to accounts payable, right? And so when the auditor individually audits those accounts, right, what they're saying is that if accounts receivable is misstated by 200,000 or more, then accounts receivable would be materially misstated. So that is, uh, they allocate it. Qualitative materiality right, is considered uh, when there are factors that in that uh, impact the, that could impact a reasonable user, the fact that those things exist, right? So even though something may be quantitatively immaterial, if one of these factors exists, it makes it qualitatively material. So it's going because remember, what would matter to a reasonable investor? So for example, if um, there's high fraud risk, right, then the fact that there is a quantitative, quantitatively immaterial misstatement, the auditor is going to consider that misstatement in the context of high fraud risk. Right? Or if a company <coughs> is about to miss their uh, debt covenant, right? so they're about to violate a debt covenant. So if making that entry or that a quantitatively immaterial adjustment, if that adjustment is made, it will cause the client to miss or violate their debt covenant, then that item now becomes material. So it's qualitatively material. So knowing the difference between the two, the two and um, just knowing uh, what factors could change it. So here's an example, right, of the different types of factors that could impact. Um, uh, materiality, quality. Right. Uh, uh, just the relationship between materiality and audit risk. Um, audit risk is defined in terms of the risk of material misstatement. So the higher the audit risk, the lower the materiality level assessed by the auditor. So what does high audit risk mean? Isn't it a high risk that the auditors will issue an opinion saying that there is no right. um, material right. statement when there is? Exactly, right? The, that's the risk that you issue an incorrect audit opinion, right? So if there's a high risk in that, because, you know, if there's a high risk, then you want material. So you, by lowering materiality, you're going to look at a lot more, right? So a lot more items are going to be considered, right? Because that number is lower than if it's higher. Uh, so you're going to consider more. Um, uh, also, the auditor has to consider when you're look, thinking about inherent risk, right? Inherent risk uh, and materiality. Uh, if there are, remember the definition of inherent risk is the risk that uh, the account can contain a material misstatement. So there's some, some accounts that are inherently very risky. So things like 
accounts that are subject to more complex judgment and that are more subjective. Uh, the audit risk model, chapter four. The audit risk model is the framework that auditors use to determine their audit approach. The risk, there are four components to it, the auditor controls two. They have no control over inherent risk and control risk, they can only assess those two factors. Those are factors that are borne by the client's environment. So the auditor is going to respond to the risk <coughs> material statement, and that's what detection risk is. How much risk are they willing to accept that their audit procedures will not detect a material mistake? So that's the, the auditor controls the audit risk they're willing to accept and the detection risk that they're willing to accept <laughs> in response to the client's environment. Uh, if I say inherent risk and control risk, you should automatically know that I've just described the factors that make up the risk of material misstatement. So how does the risk of material, the, the uh, so, inherent risk, it's a, first, inherent risk and detection risk move to right. right. So, if inherent risk is high, then detection risk is going to be low. Right? So, when you say that inherent risk is high, there's a high risk of material mistake. And remember, you consider inherent assess inherent risk without considering internal controls. Because what you're trying to determine is what's, how likely is it that this account uh, this, could, there could, would contain a material mistake? What are the factors that would drive it? Right? Um, so you also should know what are the factors that impact inherent risk that would lead to inherent risk being high versus low versus moderate. Same thing with control risk, right? Inversely. If there's high control risk, the auditor is going to lower detection risk. So if that, what that says is the risk of material statement is high, then right, the detection risk has to be lower. The auditor is, will, is only willing to take a very little risk that they will not uncover a material misstatement through their audit procedures. And that's this nature. I think I had a more detailed one in my in the notes. Wait, so if the inherent risk is high and the detection risk is low, does that mean that they're going to look into like more accounts and transactions? Yeah. Right. So, right, so inherent risk, so uh, inherent risk is high, control risk is high, right? The detection risk is going to be low. So that means they're going to, and they're going to examine more transactions. Yeah. So detection risk impacts the nature, timing, and extent of audit procedures performed. Nature is the type of audit procedures, extent meaning the amount of audit procedures, or amount of audit evidence, I should say, and then timing is just when they perform those. So if you have high risk of material misstatement, you're going to audit much closer to the balance sheet day. Right? Then, so, that would mean you can't rely on internal control, so it would be no reason for you to test internal controls. And also keep in mind, and you'll see this when we talk about the audit, when we talk about revenue, auditors, so the, the audit risk model is an overall planning model, but remember the auditor, audit, auditors audit segments, right, at times. So they're going to audit the debt cycle, they're going to audit the acquisition and expenditure cycle, the inventory financing cycles. So they're going to look at risk and material mistake in each of those cycles as well. So there, the types of audit tests, right, that's the detection list, is going to be this, the extent of these audits, the nature, the mix of these audit procedures. They're, uh, they're test of controls and substantive tests. Substantive tests consist of test of transactions, detailed test of transactions, uh, test of account balances, such as accounts receivable, accounts payable, and substantive analytical procedures. Of those three types of substantive tests, substantive analytical procedures are the least effective 
right? Because why? What is it about analytical procedures that's different from detailed tests of transactions? Yes, so you're making an estimate, and then you're as the auditor, and then you're comparing that to like what's actually right. on the right. Right, you have an expectation. So you you're not really looking at documentation. So especially during the planning stage, right? Analytical procedures are attention directed. And so you have an expectation based on your, the knowledge you've developed through understanding the client, right, in the beginning, in the planning process. And so your procedures are only as good as your, the results or your conclusions are only as good as the, the estimates that you initially make. So it doesn't tell you. So you would never use analytical procedures to test revenue alone, right? It would not be sufficient. It would accompany other procedures that you perform like testing controls over revenue, testing transactions, testing account balances. And so all of these procedures or types of market <coughs> tests are designed to give you sufficient, confident evidence as uh, described under the general set of accounting standards. So the key thing to know is, so, so I'm never gonna ask you, as I said this before, you will not need a calculator. There will be no numbers that you have to calculate with this audit list model. You have to know to understand the relationships of the components of the audit list model. So like the previous thing. So right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I got that. Right? So you have to know how risk material in the statement impacts the detection risk. Right? You have to know the relationship. So that's what I care about that you understand the qualitative aspects of that model. Not, I'm not gonna ask you to you know, run numbers, because that tells me nothing. It just tells me you know how to do math, which I expect at this point. <laughs> Wait, so what's an example of the test of balance? Test of um, details? Yeah. Confirming accounts receivable. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Confirming cash. Account balances like the back the accounts on the balance sheet. Test a, a, an example of test of transactions would be to select a sample of sales from the sales journal and uh, vouch those to the shipping documents, right? Because what you're testing is the amounts that are reported in the revenue account. Remember, assertions are going to be based on ASB assertions. So you would need to know what, uh, am I talking about transactions and events, am I talking about balance sheet, or am I talking about presentation and disclosure? So you go to know the assertions laid out in the index, that was that exhibit was 115, I think, I think. Yeah, right, I think it's, it's in chapter one, I think it's one. Right. So understand the assertions. Uh, and what they relate to. So when I talk about occurrence, right, you're going to automatically know that I must be talking about transactions, assertions about transactions and events, because transactions occur, and we have account balances as a result of those transactions, right? So transactions and events are things that kind of flow that, that flow through the income statement, uh, and then the account balances are what result at the end of the period, the quarter period, as a result of those transactions. <coughs> so, category, and remember the assertions, for t the auditor is going to get evidence about assertions. So management makes assertions, auditors gather evidence about the assertions that management makes. So auditors, uh, audit objectives are tied to the assertions of that management makes. So auditors want to get evidence that revenue reporting has been earned because management has made the assertions that revenue occurred, that it's valid, and it wasn't made to a fictitious customer, so it's valid. So now the auditor has to gather evidence about that. How do they gather evidence about it? If we're talking about occurrence, they're going to start with the sales journal and file that to shipping, to source documents, which in this case would be the shipping documents because that tells us that it's been, it's shipped, so we can recognize the revenue. That's in accordance with gas. And remember, uh, I mean gap. remember the assertions are tied to gap. 
if the auditor wants to test, when the auditor tests completeness, same, same journal, same document. However, the direction changes, right? Because completeness says that everything that should be recorded has been recorded. So the auditor wants to know that revenue is not understated, that revenue contains all revenue earned. So you start with the sample uh, shipping documents and trace those back to the sales journal. So you start with the source document, take it back to the journal, and occurrence you start with the journal and tie it to the source document. So direction matters. Um, accuracy is just as it says, Classific accurate, or classification is the things are recorded in the right account. So the only thing that should be recorded in revenue is revenue from customers, right, from operations, not revenue because you sold a machine. That would not be recorded in revenue, yes. Uh, are all the versions of the dual direction? Are they? I don't understand. There is a dual direction test. Dual purpose test. Yes. That's, a, that's different. That's not the not direction. Not the dual purpose, the dual direction. Like, for example, for the occurrence and completeness, they're like dual direction. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Right. So, no. So, the only thing, the, what that is saying is that you're basically using the same, you're using the same journal and the same documents, right? Source mm -hmm. documents. But the direction, is going to drive what assertion you're gathering evidence about. Okay. That's okay. what that means. Okay. And that's only for the cumulative completeness? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so cutoff is that it's recorded in the, the correct time period. Right, so you want to make sure, so the auditors will be performing procedures to make sure that revenue that the revenue that's reported has been earned on or before 1231. And, and 1231 is the year end that you're reporting. Then the assertions about account balances are the key assertion of existence, right? Meaning that that account exists, right? So as of the balance sheet, the receivables that we have reported are actually receivables. If they haven't been paid off, they haven't been written off. The standard audit procedure is to confirm accounts receivable. Um, completeness is what it says, and everything that should be included is included, and you'll notice that completeness is an assertion that's made under each category of assertion. Valuation deals with the net, realis net realizable value of the account. Right, so if you see something with valuation, I'm going to normally, in, in the revenue cycle, be talking about uh, the allowance without the account. And then rights, rights means that the company has the right, they own, they haven't factored their accounts receivable, there are no means against their accounts receivable or their assets. Right? So that's what rights mean. And then presentation is disclosure. <coughs> Are, they're thinking the same thing. It's just that we're talking about how things are presented in the financial statements, right? Financial statements say that you present your accounts receivable at its net value, net realizable value. So meaning debt of allowance without the account. Accounts receivable is reported as a current asset. Um, and then it also relates to the footnotes that are required. That there, the footnotes are complete. Uh, based on uh, footnotes as required by GAAP. So as I said before, uh, auditors make, uh, uh, determine their audit procedures or their audit objective based on management's assertions, right? So that's they're going to gather evidence. So I gave this, these examples already, but just a occurrence, the Management <coughs> assertion that uh, revenue is valid. Auditors gather evidence, perform audit procedures to gather evidence that they are indeed valid. So reported sales of the shipments made to uh, non fictitious customers. Uh, so internal control. The things that you're going to want to know about internal controls is management's responsibility. <coughs> Just like the financial statements are management's responsibility, uh, internal controls are management's responsibility. The auditor's responsibility is to provide an opinion about the effectiveness of management's internal controls. 
So for publicly held companies. So that means that auditors have to test control. You remember they assess control risk, right? As a part of the risk material misstatement. Um, so what you want to know, make sure you understand, is understand how auditors go about, and that's a part of the risk assessment process, assessing control risk, and, and what they do to gain an understanding of internal controls. Um, understand why internal controls are important and how they impact uh, the financial statements. Know what the COSO framework is, the five components. You don't have to know the principles, you just have to know the components and have a understanding of what each component uh, is meant to capture. So just control environment represents the tone at the top, right? What, what kind of message is management conveying? How um, actively involved, or, uh, what kind of oversight is provided by the audit committee of those charged with corporate, gov corporate governance? Control activities consist of the actual control procedures that the company has in place, such as segregation of duties, um, performance reviews. And so know it in general, you don't have to memorize the principles. Um, no segregation of duties, right? So remember how we went through that problem, right? Where we assigned and we had 10, uh, 10 tasks, three people, and you had assigned it so you did not create uh, a violation of segregation of duties. And remember, it's important that segregation of duties, the objective is to ensure that no one person can commit a fraud or an error and conceal it. Know what, know what is important in the internal control, what important controls are, uh, that should be in place for the revenue and collection cycle. Remember the key steps is identify the client's business risk, right? And that's going to help the auditor assess inherent risk, uh, assess what the tolerable misstatement and assess it. The tolerable misstatement deals with materiality and assess the inherent risk, assess control risk, then design and test your perform your test of controls. And so remember, if you say that you can't rely on internal controls, there would be no point in testing them. Because what's the point of testing something you can't rely on? Right? So then you would move to a purely substantive test of transactions and account balances, design and perform analytical procedures, and design and test uh, the, your test, substantive test of account balances. Right? Remember, the last three represent uh, the substantive test, uh, analytical procedures, and uh, test of account balances are all substantive tests of which analytical procedures are the least effective. Analytical procedures, remember, consist of looking at relationships amongst the accounts, um, looking at changes in the accounts. So you might, for less uh, risky accounts, let's say repairs and maintenance, you might perform analytical procedures as a form of evidence, right? Because the, the risk is really low, and the expectation is there's not a lot of activity. Um, so we're going to actually talk a little bit about this today when we cover the record cycles on the uh, But this is just some examples of the types of audit tests and audit that we perform in uh, the test of control versus a substantive test of transaction. Um, and we'll see procedures, types of tests that represent detailed account balances. Uh, fraud. So know the difference between employee fraud and management fraud. Management fraud is often referred to as fraudulent financial reporting. Employee fraud is usually referred to as misappropriation of assets. Um, you should understand SAT, the requirements under SAS 99 and also, as I said, this was before I updated it, the PCOB. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to memorize those standards, but just know those standards tell you what the auditor's responsibilities are. So just make sure you're familiar with those. Um, and then what the auditor should do when they suspect fraud. Um, no fraud risk factors. So you remember uh, in the lecture I gave fraud risk factors by um, you know, the company's operations. Uh, so I had a whole list there. Um, and I also think I posted that on Blackboard under additional reading materials under fraud. So 
uh, some examples of fraud risk factors, um, kind of focus on those that relate to the revenue cycle, and then just in general, um, what kind of corporate governance should exist to uh, provide oversight to reduce fraud risk, and know the components of the fraud triangle. Right? And that, uh, motivation, or incent motivation incentives, opportunity, you know. Uh, no. Say it again. Rationalization. Rationalization, attitude, yes. Right. So no vote. Right. So you should know, um, if I gave you a scenario, right, you should be able to tell me whether or not that is a, a that scenario relates to what component of the fraud triangle. So for example, if I tell you that uh, there's an overbearing management who is always uh, pressuring employees, that would tell you what? Right, right. But I didn't tell you what, so that is an attitude, right? That's an attitude that the company projects, an overall tone at the top. If I said that there's management is overly concerned about meeting or beating analysts forecast. That's incentives. Hmm? Incentives. Right, motivation incentives. If I say internal controls are lax. Right. So. Uh, that fraudulent financial, the no difference between fraudulent financial reporting and misappropriation of assets. Um, what the auditor's responsibilities are for assessing the risk of fraud. So there's uh, the PCOB uh, is 2401, uh, AS2401, and, AIC, and AICPA is uh, SAS 99. So you really should just focus on 2401, but actually SAS 99, there's a, uh, uh, there's a SAS 99 uh, um, refresher kit or something that I posted uh, in, the, in there that kind of lays it out really nicely and the differences in the standards are not. What I want you to know for this, this standard with respect to fraud risk is not, it would be covered in SAS 99 as well. So SAS 99, it's a primer, I think, for SAS 99. I think it lays out the uh, fraud risk factors, talks about brainstorming, but then I also posted the fraud risk factors from the PCOB standard as well. So you'll be fine, whichever you by looking at PCOB. Um, there's the four triangle we <coughs> talked about. Um, so now we're going to talk about the collection, uh, the revenue and collection cycle. So we'll, we'll go through that now. So before I go, we'll go to the revenue and uh, collection cycle. Any questions? Yes. Uh, besides management assertions, is there anything else that we should uh, review from like previous, the previous exam or some of the audit? Mm, no, because we didn't cover the audit this model of materiality on the previous exam. Okay. So just, just assertions. Right, the assertions are going to be uh, yeah, as, really, as, really as related, related to the record side. Okay, thank you. Customers 
should orders should be placed by cust approved customers, right? You don't want a company, you don't want to see where orders can just be placed by any customer. I mean, obviously there's some business models that that's the case where Amazon, right? They don't check to see if you're, you know, if you're an approved customer. In fact, if you can pay. But they have the, uh, like the third party in the bank. Right, that's so you, because you're going to pay with a credit card, yeah. right? So if you don't, so, and that's cash, so there, there's no receivable, right? So there's very little risk. What's the, uh, you know, um, also there's little risk of, well, not little, there's fraud risk, right? But that's the bank, right? So the bank, if someone orders something using um, your credit card, they're relying on controls around that you're going to say, wait a minute, I never ordered this, right? So they have obviously um, they have concerns about that, right? Because if somehow you, someone's able to place an order and order goods, and then I come back and say, look, I never ordered that, that didn't go to my address, then um, they kind of, the goods have been shipped and they've lost the goods and, and they have to deal with whatever they deal with with the bank. But there's, you know, so online, you know, fraud purchasing is, is a big concern. But, but banks have a vested interest in that, right? They have a vested interest in ensuring that, um, you know, they have controls in place to identify fraud, right? So you see, and you, you guys all have credit cards, so you know some, if there's some unusual activities on, activity on your account, they'll contact you, right, to yeah, say, alerts. you get alerts, you right? We've all signed up for the alerts. You can just shut off your cards. Right, that is that's happened to me where I go to use my card and they're like, uh, no. <laughs> so I'm like, wait a minute, I did pay my bill and I, I do have you know a line of credit, but but then they'll you usually I'll then check my phone and realize I got a fraud alert. So once I verify that um, you know uh, I didn't do something, then they'll take your card. You know they shut down your card. But anyway, so let's just talk about in a brick and mortar type business, right? Where a customer is gonna call in, they're gonna place an order, you wanna make sure, there should be controls to ensure that it's a valid customer, that that customer has been approved. So some of the evidence source would obviously be the customer order. So there should be controls around the customer order, right? That should be, um, there should be, uh, what do you call, um, pre-numbered documents for the customer order to make sure it's complete, right? Um, the customer order, there should be evidence that uh, the customer order was was processed for a valid customer. And actually the customer master file comes into play. So the customer master file would be what whether the system goes out and checks against that customer number against the customer master file, or the clerk uh, who's uh, processing the order uh, goes and checks the, the customer master file in the system to make sure that it's a valid customer. So um, things that auditors are gonna look for is evidence that that is being done, but also that the customer mass, there are controls on a customer master file. What are some controls you think should be on a customer master file? Any idea? What's gonna be important? Especially if you're trying to evaluate. Credit approval? Credit approval? Okay, but that's on the customer, right? So you would want, that would be information in the customer master file. But I'm thinking about the maintenance of the customer master file. Who, who has the ability to change customer Right. What kind of authorization? Who has access to update the customer master file? Right. And what kind of documentation is generated if the customer master file is updated? Who authorizes and approves it and checks it? Right. So you want to see that the master file. There's so one of the things you expect to see too is that the customer master file or any master file is maintained currently. Right. So that you're purging in after a period of time, purging inactive accounts or purging customers that you no longer do business with. So there's um, controls over that. The other evidence source would be the credit check, the approval files, right? Because you don't want to, one of the things you would expect to see, especially if you're in an environment where you're giving customers, you're granting them credit, you want to make sure that there's a credit check that's been done and who has the ability to do that, who's authorized to do it, and what kinds of controls are in place around grants and credit or overriding credit. Um, and then the price map, this master file, which contains the prices for the, co for the companies, the goods that they're selling. And so you want to make sure that that, your controls ensure that that's being updated on a timely basis. If the if prices are overridden, 
what kind of controls are in place over that, who authorizes that. So that's the processing of customer. And now you've processed the customer. It's a valid customer. They have sufficient credit, right? And everything else is uh, met, right? It, it, we're charging them prices per the master file, the price list master file. Now we want to deliver the goods and service to the customers. That's the shipping. So again, depending on the shipping terms, FOB shipping means when it leaves our premises, when it leaves our warehouse, we record revenue, right? We consider revenue to be earned. So an important document there is going to be the shipping document, right? And we've already talked about the different audit procedures that auditors use because the shipping document provides evidence that revenue was earned. So the audit has a key document. So we want controls over the shipping document. Who has access to the shipping document? Uh, is a shipping document, are shipping documents uh, numerically sequenced? Uh, sales journal, right, because that's which sales transactions are reported. Uh, is a sales journal uh, reconciled and updated on a timely basis? Uh, sales analysis report is what it suggests. Um, it's a detailed report, but uh, you may look at sales by product line, by region by uh, period, by customer. So you could look at it in any way to just, so an auditor might use the sales analysis report to perform analytical procedures to see if there's any uh, unusual activity amongst the, uh, the different products that the company sells or unusual activity in a particular region, right? And management might use this to just see if they're in line with their objectives and also to determine whether or not Sales are tracking in a way uh, along budget, budgeted uh, uh, numbers. Then, once we deliver the goods, we want to make sure that we build our customer, right? So we ship the goods. We should be, so if information about that shipment should immediately go to update the sales journal and update accounts receivable, right? Debit receivables, credit revenue, and that a invoice is generated that goes to the customer, that serves as billing the customer. So the important documents would be uh, the shipping document, obviously, the accounts receivable trial balance, the, and the accounts receivable age trial balance. Those are the, the documents that the auditor would use. And then once we build a customer, we want to make sure that we collect and report to whatever terms we open the customer. So the cash receipts listing or the cash receipts journal, and then customer statements, which are monthly statements that the company probably sent out, showing the customer here's the activity for the month, showing sales as well as cash receipts. Yes. Oh, just <coughs> no. I don't know why that was. Statement is high, that would presume that their controls are relaxed. 
but let's just say they set it at moderate, then they're going to address the set their detection risk to deal with that, um, to, to deal with the fact that uh, risk material is considered to be moderate. So some of the inherent risk factors um, that you're going to consider, industry factors, right? So you, and this is, remember, these are things that the auditor would have assessed or looked at or evaluated when they were going through the planning process, right? Understanding the, the client, understanding the entity, the environment that they're in. So you want to look at what kind of industry-related factors could increase inherent risk in the revenue cycle for a client. Right, for that process. So let's say, for example, they're in a highly competitive industry. Right? That's going to impact revenue. Um, let's say, for example, they um, the industry is not doing well, right, overall. So the industry's revenue overall is depressed. That impacts the, the company as well. So let's say they have products that are coming off patent that are no longer on patent. And that's going to affect revenue as well. So you want to look at, again, what are the industry, what are the risks that are flowing by the industry that this, this client is in, um, and how does that impact revenue? Also, what about the complexity? So in the, most of the scenarios that I've described, we've had a very simple revenue recognition model, right? Ship the goods, record revenue. And that's really easy. There's no subjectivity around that. The biggest issue is ensuring, uh, obviously, that revenue is only reported for one ship, but that's not hard to determine. Because right? you could grab, look at, sample it, sample some uh, transactions reported, trace those to uh, the shipping document. So that's not, there's no real judgment here. Right? It's no, it's a yes or no. Do we ship it? Yes, report it. No, then you can't report it. But there are revenue recognition. Um, models that involve some level of judgment, or, right? So judgment about whether or not the service has been performed, right? If it's multiple criteria <coughs> to um, determine that uh, a service is complete, then the, then the auditor, that creates more subjectivity and judgment, especially if it's not very black and white. So that would be a more complex revenue recognition model. So anytime there's more complexity, right, it increases the inherent risk, increases the risk of material mistake. Um, whether or not there's difficulty in auditing the transactions and the account balances. Um, so again, with the example that I gave with the revenue recognition where there's more judgment involved, that makes it more complex to audit. Right? Because you're looking at management, you're relying on or try to gather evidence about the judgments that management has made. Um, and then whether or not there's a history of misstatements in the account you know, the, from the, the uh, detected misstatements. So some very specific, specific risks related to in, um, improper revenue recognition would be obviously cut off. So cut off again is that uh, revenue is recorded in the wrong period <coughs> to overstatement of revenue. Bill and hold. So bill and hold is a scheme that a company would use where they bill their customers, but they haven't shipped the goods. Right? And that's unusual. Um, and if it's an industry practice, the auditor would already know that. Um, so it would then it would not. Uh, they would be prepared to audit that account or very, you know, audit those types of transactions a uh, different way. But normally, most times, if you don't ship something, it's going to be difficult to say that revenues, the earnings process is complete. And so bill and hold is a way for companies, especially you see, um, if you see, if it's unusual for the company to have those types of transactions, but you'll see it toward the year end, toward the end of the year. Where um, and it, it you, the auditor will probably have other factors that would suggest that the client is trying to manage uh, their revenue, but that's usually what they're trying to do. They're trying to increase the revenue that's reported, 
Um, so you want to look, at, so you'll see that right here, and I'll start talking. They want to, like, uh, Right, they're trying to inflate back there. And that would be a proper revenue. Because if you didn't ship it, then the earnings process is not. There's, uh, you have to transfer the, the, the rights to those good. Channel stuffing is similar, except that you are building a customer, but you're just moving stuff out. You're just pushing it out into the market. Right? And you're probably selling it, you're building a customer. And then they got to return it. Right, and then they have to return it because they didn't order it. And then sometimes there'll be some side deal <coughs> where the salesperson might say, hey, you know, you know, it's year end, I gotta make my numbers, gotta buy the kids the new toys, you know. Help, help me out. I'm gonna send this to you, you take it, but it will bill you, but then you can send it back. Well, those side deals are hard to determine, right? Detect, because, you know, it's hard, it's not like they have it in a written contract. So, the way you're gonna usually catch something like this, or why auditors look at sales returns in subsequent months, right, subsequent to the year end, if you see a high level of returns coming back at the beginning of the year, right, at the beginning of the year or even like in the first quarter, right, uh, the first two months of the year, then that might seem a little problem. And so think, remember the sales analysis report. You, if you have, depending on the client system, you might be able to go down to the sales analysis report by region or, or even by salesperson. So it's also important to understand how salespeople are paid. Are they paid on commission? Is a big chunk of their salary paid on commission? Then that creates incentives for them. So, uh, but that is, uh, you know, a, a way to, again, the, the objective here is to try to inflate revenue. And you will see, you will see that they're, uh, even a bill at home, even though they haven't, should, you'll see reversals of, uh, of, of sales that were made, right? or some credits, credit memos issued to the customer. So if you see an unusual activity of those types of transactions, that's usually, a red, that's a fraud risk factor, that's a red flag. Um, and then obviously other inherent risk relates to accounts receivable, um, uh, the collectability of accounts receivable. So in terms of the significant accounts, um, of course cash is a significant account, but cash is an, um, an account that, uh, that spans most of just about every single business cycle, actually all of them, right? So we will we'll cover cash separately, but for the revenue and the collection cycle, the key um, <coughs> accounts will be revenue and accounts receivable, and those accounts related to those, two, so, such as allowance without accounts. And so what um, the, uh, when an auditor is looking at this, remember the, the relevant assertions, and their management assertions, the auditor is thinking, what can go wrong? If we're talking about occurrence, right, which basically says that, every, that the sales that we reported, the revenues that's been reported are valid, right, it's the names of non fictitious customers, the auditor, what can go wrong is that revenue is reported, but something has not been shipped. Right? Revenue reported for shipment is not there. Whereas completeness is understatement. Revenue is not reported for shipment. Shipments were made, revenue, corresponding revenue is not reported. So the auditor is going to look at this as what could go wrong, right, and then design their audit procedures to gather evidence about these assertions that management's making. Accounts receivable, key assertions of 74, and then the existence and valuation. So uh, that the accounts receivable that we have reported do exist as of the balance sheet date. Not that they ever existed, but that as of the balance sheet date they exist. And that they're balanced <coughs> net of allowance without the net. Key control procedures, right? Remember from the COSO framework, we have five types of control activities. And those activities are going to be the general type of activity and then the actual detailed control procedure the company has in place is going to be dependent on the company system. So essentially, 
separation of duties, right? Uh, this is what we would call a segregation of duties matrix. So across the columns, you have the different functions, and then along the rows, you have the actual activities that take place in this particular cycle. So you'll see here, receiving and preparing the customer order, the department that would handle that would be um, the audit entry department. Approving credit to X is not there, but it would be the credit department. Um, you can see that authorization of uh, account receivable write-offs, that would be done by the treasurer, like somebody who is not responsible for maintaining the books and records of any way. So remember the, the, the components of the liquidity segregation. Uh, so you'll see all of the different um, accounts receivable functions, I'm sorry, uh, revenue and accounts receivable functions, and then allocate those. So an auditor will look at this matrix um, as a starting point, right, to see this is what the client is presenting, that these, that these are, to look at this matrix and say, uh, does the client's uh, controls map with, with what we would expect to see uh, for uh, segregation of duties for revenue? So what is that chart? Like a detailed list of segregation of duties, that's something that the client actually has to do to that order? Um, well, usually, the, the, it depends. some clients, depending on how well they control the document, right? but an auditor could put this together based on inquiry of the client and their right. understanding of the control. Yeah. Obviously, it's not a mass the right departments, and it depends, right? Sometimes, you know, if the auditor prepares they might put the department in the <coughs> thing. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, then the universal schedule mm -hmm. can go back it cannot go any other way around. Wait, like, like that. Like, is it like universal for every client? It should look like that. Um, this is kind of not, you know, but this is more broad because just a, 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 the revenue cycle in general. So, uh, for a particular client, this could be a lot more detailed, right? Because they could have uh, within order entry, they might have different functions. In, Within credit, they might have you know different uh, functions, so it could be actually more expansive for a particular client. But just based on the broad categories of the revenue and collection cycle, this is just this is a kind of more general. So, for example, somebody who does the cash receipts cannot do does the receiving customer commitment. But you cannot do re receive it and prepare customer order. Right. So so you say somebody who has the uh, custody of assets? Somebody who so has cash receipts, custody of assets. This person is going to receive the customer's uh, remittance? Remittance, right. That's just the, the, the cash. Okay. The but cash. You, so you cannot receive and prepare the orders if it receives the cash. Right, but then what you, so let's think about it, because could that person, if they... I'm trying like, to think like when this separation of duty is, like, is not right. Okay. So you cannot do two things at the same time. So if it puts you in a position of being able to steal, right? Let's say to steal that cash and then <laughs> write it off and cover it up. So if, if, if you had the person receiving and preparing a customer order, Right, so they received it from the customer, and then would they also receive the cash? Um, you would probably have compensating controls there um, if they, because if let's say if they receive the cash, since they don't set up the account receivable, it would be detected. Right, so they have no ability. So if they stole the cash, it would show up in account receivable. Right, because when we sent the customer a statement. Or when we did the aging, we would see that um, that there's a problem, and you follow up with the customer. The customer would say, "I said it," right? So there's so, it's not so to the extent that you can segregate it, segregate. But then you would look to say, "Okay, we have fewer people doing this, right? So we don't have somebody who could. We need somebody who can prepare the customer. I mean, uh, receive customer." Right, receive customer remittance, we don't have somebody who can do that. If you gave it to the audit entry clerk, then it would be ideal, but there'd be compensating control. So those controls, but those controls would have to be strong, right? That they're performing um, uh, 
they're, they're reviewing their accounts receivable on a timely basis, like a monthly basis. And then, you know, sending out uh, customer statements. So a customer will complain about it. Okay. On the exam, are we going to be asking the separation of duty? So remember the problem we did in class? Yes. Yeah, so, right, so I could give you a problem like that. But if I, just as I gave it to you in class, where I told you, okay, I have to sign these, these responsibilities to these three or four people, then you have to be able to, um, you know, assign the remaining responsibilities so that you don't create, you don't violate segregation. So that person should not, so for example, the accounts receivable person should never receive the cash. Why? Because they have, they update the books and records. So they would be able to say that it was paid, right? And steal the cash and say, and say that, that it was, they could write off the accounts receivable or something like that. They should be able to do that, right? Or they should, they would just check it off as paid. So would it come out, right? It would come out in the reconciliation process, the bank, right? Because you won't have the money. There'll be a shortage of cash. Right? So similar to the problem that we did in class. That, I mean, it's not going to be something that like, like where there's 50 different combinations. Right? Because then, you yeah, know, that's ridiculous. And I'm not trying to you know, see how many creative ways you can segregate your responsibilities. I just, what I wanted to see is that you know what creates um, a violation or a violation. Right. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to skip this. I'll post this because I just want to get to. Um, related to the revenue cycle. If you look in chap um, chapter seven, appendix uh, one, appendix seven A, which is on page, uh, page uh, 332. You'll know this is a, an example of an internal control questionnaire for the revenue collection cycle. And you'll notice that the controls are broken out by assertion that they would address. So, uh, for example, under occurrence, is access to sales invoice blanks restricted? Well, why is that important at all? Because if someone could initiate, uh, have access to a sales invoice, they could create a fictitious sale. Are they compensating controls to cover it? More than likely. Show up. But the point is that the, you would expect that the lack of that control could lead to a fictitious sale. Right? And that means that it's not, uh, it, the revenue shouldn't be recognized, but it's not about the sale. So these are just uh, some examples of the types of controls that should exist. Right? So the, the questionnaire is in the form of questions, but if you take that one, the control would be access to the documents and records are restricted, right? or that they're um, uh, only authorized personnel have access to sales invoices, blank sales invoices. That would be the control. Um, so then the auditor, so in, in the, the objective of the, the internal control questionnaire is for the auditors to gather evidence about whether or not so the controls are operating as described, right? Um, so they would look for uh, evidence. So, to, so for example, if they, if there were no answers to some of these internal control questions on the internal control questionnaire, that signifies that that's a potential control deficiency. Then the auditor would look at, um, well, are there comp? You know that. This should be the control, but are there compensating controls? And if they're not compensating controls, then the auditor has to determine how significant that control deficiency is. 
and also whether or not it rises to the level of being a material defense based on uh, the definition. So, um, so the auditor's going to test internal controls, right? Um, and then they're going to determine if they could rely on internal controls, right? They'll test internal controls, uh, and that means that they're going to perform, rely more on internal controls, and it will impact the, um, the timing and extent of the substantive procedures that they perform. But the substantive procedures that they're going to perform are going to be on accounts receivable, the allowance of bad debt, um, bad debt expense, cash, and sales returns and allowances. But we're going to focus on, just for the uh, our discussion, on accounts receivable and the allowance for document accounts as well as substantive test of transactions, which relate to um, the uh, substantive uh, substantive test of transactions, right? So getting uh, evidence about the transactions. So, and all, what the auditor, the, the game plan that the auditor follows or the approach is to identify the account, right? And determine whether uh, there's a chance that it could contain a material misstatement, risk of material misstatement, right? Relate that to the relevant assertion Assertion is relevant if it has a reasonable possibility of containing a misstatement that would cause the financial statements to be materially misstated. And so we saw with revenue, occurrence, completeness, cutoff, accounts receivable, we saw that as being existence or um, evaluation. Then the auditor says, well, what can go wrong? Right? Relating it to that assertion. Um, and then what, and so that what could go wrong? The source of the misstatement, right? That's the source of the misstatement that could cause the material misstatement. Um, and then assess the controls in place. Is there a control activity in place that mitigates that risk? Um, so for example, if we're talking about revenue and occurrence, you could, there could be a sale reported or revenue reported and an item didn't ship, for items that did not ship. The control that you would expect to see would be a control that uh, is designed to ensure that revenue is only reported when a goods are shipped. So evaluate the controls that the company has in place to mitigate that what could go wrong, that risk. Then the auditor test that control, because you have to test the control to determine whether or not the control is operating as designed and whether the person who is responsible for the control has the authority and competence uh, to implement that control. So substantive procedures, right, what, uh, what you know, there could be uh, substantive um, analytical procedures, but remember, those are not sufficient um, for just testing, for testing an account like revenue or accounts receivable, because those are uh, more risk, riskier accounts. So it would be something to supplement the substantive test of the transactions or substantive test of, of, of account balances. So let's look at an example with revenue. So as I said, the significant account in this would be revenue and accounts receivable. So for revenue, uh, we've already determined that the relevant assertion is a current. And the, so what could go wrong, we saw in the previous slide, management may overstate sales by adding fictitious transactions or inflating actual sales, uh, and they may fail to recognize the possibility of customer return. Um, so then internal controls, right, to mitigate that risk, we would expect to see that invoices are supported by customer purchase orders, right, meaning that it's a valid order that a customer ordered the goods. The bill of lading, meaning that it's, a, it's valid revenue because we shipped it, right? That the goods were shipped, um, or other shipping documents, uh, for all invoices and recorded sales in the sales journal. So again, for occurrence, we're gonna, we would take a sample of, okay, we would take a sample of, uh, 
uh, journals, uh, entries posted in a sales journal, and then we would tie that to the shipping documents, right? Um, the, the test and controls that the auditor will perform, and this is what we call a dual purpose test, right? By selecting a sample of entries recorded in a sales journal and tying those to supporting documentation such as the shipping document, purchase order, the auditor, the auditor is gathering evidence not only about the controls, but also about the account balance, the information or amounts reported in the sales journal. And that's what we call a dual purpose test. So they have, they have more information. By performing that one procedure, they can gather information about the, the internal control, the effectiveness of internal controls over um, revenue, reporting revenue, as well as information about the amounts that are reported, the transactions reported. Um, so I'm going to go to accounts receivable. So accounts receivable, we said that um, existence is a relevant assertion. What could go wrong? Accounts receivable are overstated and do not represent actual sales. The internal control activity would be check sales orders and shipping documents to make sure sales were earned and a customer owes a balance. Right? Again, you're, you're using the so the sales journal says you know if the the, the test of controls that we perform over reporting sales right, um, would give us information about the updating accounts receivable because we would look to see that a corresponding accounts receivable is reported. Right. And we also have to determine whether or not the customer is still over the balance. So we would be looking at controls over cash receipts as well. Right. Test the controls when payments are received, voucher checks listed on, on the deposit slips to the customer credit listed. So basically seeing the process that the company has in relieving the accounts receivable uh, when payments are or vouch, or when payments are made. And then a substantive test is to vouch, uh, I'm sorry, to confirm accounts receivable. Right? Because you, you're confirming accounts receivable as of the balance sheet date. So one side, on one hand, you know that the accounts receivable that was created was valid through your test of uh, uh, controls over the revenue, over reporting of revenue. The other test is meant to determine whether or not that balance as reported, still reported as a 1231, is a valid balance that, that, that receivable still exists. Valuation deals with the net revisable value. What could go wrong? Receivables are not included in the financial statements at the appropriate amount. Otherwise, they're not valued appropriately, not at their net revisable value. A control that would mitigate with the authorizer report discounts when customers take them. Management evaluates, so two things. Management evaluates the collectability of delinquent receivables on a timely basis, meaning that management, it's not the auditor's responsibility to create an aging analysis, it is management's responsibility to do that. They provide it, the auditors with information about the aging analysis that they prepare, and the auditor um, uh, can test that. Uh, test of controls would be to inspect the documentation, the evidence that there's cash receipts from customers are reviewed, inquire the credit manager regarding procedures for so unpaid accounts, inspect the credit files, inspect documentation for evidence and management, evaluate the collectability of accounts receivable. Um, a test of detail would be to inspect the age file balance, compare it. Um, Current years, right old experience from prior years, allowance with debt, allowance with debt, allowance with debt, with bad debt. Right. So the auditor again is then trying to gather information. In this case, right, is how reasonable is the allowance without the account given the company's uh, aging analysis? Uh, one of just before we break with accounts receivable, the key again, the uh, the key. The audit procedure is to confirm accounts receivable, and accounts receivable, the standard require confirmation of accounts receivable. The auditor has to have a valid reason not to confirm accounts receivable, and that is usually based on past history.
history that the, you know, they have evidence that customers don't respond. But they have to perform accounts receivable. Otherwise, um, if they do not, right, if the customer, if they send out a confirmation and the customer does not respond to that confirmation, auditors are required to perform alternative procedures. A common alternative procedure is to look at subsequent cash collections. Right? So if that receivable is outstanding at 1231 and the auditor sees that that receivable was paid on January 15th, that's evidence that the receivable existed and that's an example of um, subsequent.